I'm Catherine Arndt, the Chief of the VLGA Connect Studio. Welcome to today's episode, brought to you by the VLGA, your councillor support network and the national broadcaster on all things local government. Hi everyone, welcome to VLGA Connect and it's time for another edition in our Local Leaders series. Now we've been talking to CEOs and mayors from around member councils across the state. We haven't really looked within uh, the VLGA because we've got some very active councillors involved on the board of the VLGA and I'm delighted to have the Vice President join me today for a chat about his local government career. It's Dr Josh Fergus. Welcome Josh. Hi Chris, thanks for having me. How do you go with a doctor and a counsellor in your title? How do you like to refer to yourself formally? Oh, look, I mean, it has the benefits that you can pick and choose sometimes, I think, Chris. Um, it, it really does depend on on the context, um, what's relevant, if anything's relevant. Yeah. Um, just Josh is fine in a lot of situations as well. So, yeah. <laughs> because I, I guess if we were to be technically correct, it would be counsellor doctor Josh Fergus, wouldn't it? Yeah. <laughs> that, that, that's that's correct. Yeah, that's um, I, I did have a, our governance team came to me and said, look, this is the this is the technical advice when I got my doctorate because I was already a counsellor. Yeah. Uh, but but I haven't had much call to use it, but I think that's correct. <laughs> Fair enough. Tell me about the doctorate. So uh, what was that in? Yeah, so my, my doctorate was uh, with the School of Social Work at University of Melbourne, and I was looking at uh, issues in foster care, and particularly the relationship between the mental health of children in foster care and, uh, and their carers, uh, and, and how those two things, um, how that relationship is really critical for health and wellbeing outcomes. I was doing that part time over over many years, uh, and it was a bit of a slog, but I got there in the end. So, when I look at your background, there's a there's a very strong theme of of mental health and fostering. You come from your your own profile says a fostering family. Tell us what that actually means. Yeah, so my mother started uh, as a foster carer when I was twelve years old, and uh, she's been fostering ever since, you know, quarter of a century now. Um, so. You know, right through my teenage years and, and through my through my twenties, it, it was uh, a case of um, having children, young people, come and go um, through our house. Really getting exposed to some of the circumstances which lead children into care, uh, what their lives are like, what their needs are, and I suppose it it sparked in me a, a real interest in in issues of, of social justice and um, you know the importance of social infrastructure and, and community support for. Uh, for people who are, are struggling at any yeah. particular point. What was that like for you as a 12-year-old? Because I'm assuming that that realisation, that spark developed over time or was it an instant thing? Well, th there are elements of it. I mean, I think, you know, when, when connecting with individual children who you get to know very well, um, you know, some some people would stay with us for, for years, you, you certainly develop that individual empathy and understanding of someone's uh, someone's life story and what's important and necessary to them. But you, you're right. I mean, the, the broader social awareness um, grew over a long time. And, and look, I, I think it's it's still developing. I think um, it, it's a lifelong thing for, for most of us. We can never know um, everything about the human experience. And so so it goes on. But certainly through my teenage years and early 20s, it was it was absolutely a growing awareness of, of the um, social determinants that influence these sort of things and uh, the, the extent of difference in, in how some people live their lives. You know, pe people's lived experience is vastly different um, from one another. We all have a lot in common, but we can have a lot um, that's, that's not as well. Uh, you were at one point the president of the Foster Care Association of Victoria. So, so clearly that spark developed into something far more substantial than you perhaps might have initially thought. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I, I'd never considered um, working in the area uh, at, at all. When, when I completed my undergraduate uh, degrees, I was offered three jobs, um, two of them in teaching, which is what I had studied to do. And one was in uh, was in the, the social uh, welfare area, working with um, working with foster carers uh, because of my uh, experience, my lived experience uh, as, as a member of a fostering household um, for, for some time. And uh, I took that job and I ended up working in that sector uh, for a number of years, obviously completed the, the PhD as well. And, and I'm still involved um, in, uh, to, to some degree in, in child protection uh, mm -hmm. matters and, you know, lending some expertise uh, around decision making in some of those areas. So, yeah, it, it has become a bit of a, a lifelong um, project so far, mm -hmm. I suppose. And 
uh, for me, I think that's reflective of how important I think it is. I mean, the, the, the children who are involved in child protection are uh, probably the most disadvantaged people in society. I think, you know, we, we, we bandy around um, conversation about disadvantage a lot, but children are, you know, inherently pretty, uh, pretty powerless. They are, they are open to and vulnerable to exploitation. And when they don't have uh, protective influences in their own lives, um, as as the children involved in the child protection system, uh, almost entirely in that situation, um, you know that, that they really they really cast adrift um, in in life and are reliant on whatever we as a, a community can provide for them. So, mm. yeah, I'm, I'm very passionate about outcomes for for kids from those backgrounds. How does that intersect with the work that you do with the charity Kevin Hines Grow? You're the CEO of that organisation. Yeah, I, I've been working at, at KHG for for the last six years. Um, it, it's certainly part of my broader interest in in social uh, social services. We work with people with um, disabilities, with mental health conditions, and uh, during my time at the organisation, we did actually start a uh, a program for children who've experienced trauma as well. So there, there's certainly an intersection. Um, I guess one of the commonalities through my uh, my non-local government career ha has always been that I've worked with vulnerable populations of, of people, and there, there are lots of um, intersections there. Uh, there there are lots of uh, crossover between those groups. So lots of children who experience um, experience care or, or interaction with the, the child protection system have a disability. Uh, they've all experienced have experiences of trauma, and so often have mental health. Uh, concerns and so working with those populations that there's a lot of um, a lot of overlap. Well, before we get off that topic, what sort of confidence do you have about um, being able to address those issues in a more meaningful way than we've been able to do in the past? Are we making progress? Well, to be honest, look, I don't think we are in terms of uh, in terms of child protection and in terms of um, reducing child maltreatment. Uh, we had. Um, uh, a landmark study come out earlier this year uh, around child maltreatment in Australia, and so it's been funded by the Australian government. It'll be a longitudinal study, and the the findings of of that really have demonstrated the extent of child maltreatment across the country. You know, so many people, uh, millions of Australians, have experienced you know, physical abuse, sexual abuse, emotional abuse, neglect as children. Um, more than we may have realised, and and they're really a flow on aspects to to all um, parts of adult life, uh, and a whole range of really complex social problems stem from people's experiences in childhood. And to be honest, since I started working in the sector, I don't think we're doing an awful lot better. We have hmm. made some um, some steps in some ways. You know, the the Royal Commission into Institutional Responses to Child Sexual Abuse, for example, is is great. Um, you know, we're starting to look at the mental health system here in Victoria, which I think you know will have benefits for, for children and adults alike. Uh, but but there's relatively small steps for the scale of the problem. I think this is mm. one of the biggest problems uh, facing Australia and indeed many many nations. Yeah, uh, let's move away from that. We haven't talked much about your role as a councillor. You you were the first Greens councillor to be elected in the city of Monash back in 2016. Re-elected again in 2020. What was the motivating factor behind putting your hand up to be a local councillor? I think because I have worked so much with, you know, seemingly really intractable social problems, I, I was interested in in having a seat at the decision-making table uh, because a lot of these things require political will, right? They, they require people who go, no, it's not good enough and it might be really difficult and it might be a problem which... Uh, spans multiple election cycles and is really challenging and might not even be particularly interesting to the general public but it's important and we know it's important uh, and we we have evidence um, which suggests that you know we can make progress and so for, for me having a seat at, at at the table and being able to influence outcomes in our community was was really important because i i was aware that there are a range of things um, that could be done a lot better uh, in areas that I was passionate about, and I thought I had a contribution to make. And that that expectation of being able to influence those issues before you became a councillor has that been matched by what you've been able to do since you were elected? I mean, yes and no. I think a lot of councillors are elected, you know, thinking that they're going to change everything, and you know, all it requires is someone there to, you know, put forward the idea, and everyone will go, "Oh, that's great, let's do that." Um, I don't think I was in that camp. I've never been too um, naive or idealistic uh, about 
you know, the ability of one person to, to make all that change. But I was prepared to do the work. And so, you know, I, I ground away at a, a range of issues which I'm really passionate about and, and got some got some good results. Um, certainly not everything that, that I would have liked. Uh, and, and, you know, that's why um, I'm still a counsellor. I think there's still more that I can do at, at some point. Um, you know, I, I might feel that that balance shifts and that, you know, it's time it's time for a break or to do something else. But at the moment, I still think there's more that I can achieve. Uh, similarly, with all these things you have on your plate that we've talked about, you put your hand up for election to the VLGA board and were successful and you've been appointed the vice president there. How do you go combining that with the other responsibilities you have? The, the VLGA is an, an amazing organisation. I, I have found it... Um, before joining the board, really useful as a councillor, and and that really inspired me to to get involved. I think I think it complements my role as a councillor. Being on the board uh, and being on the board executive now uh, provides me with a really good overview of what's happening in the sector, and I think it makes me a better councillor. So for me, I, I really view um, I view it. Uh, twofold really I'm able to make a contribution to the sector but I'm also receiving really valuable professional development which I can take um, and, and use to to benefit uh, my community through hopefully mm. a better performance as a counsellor. Mm. Uh, one thing I've noticed Josh is that you, you, you you're not afraid to use the platform you have as a counsellor and with these other roles to speak up on issues and n- not every counsellor does that Let's do. do you see, firstly, do you see that as um, a, a, a requirement of the role as a as a councillor? No, I don't think so, Chris. I mean, as as you've said, uh, you know, councillors do their roles in different ways, and I don't think there's a right or wrong way to do it. Uh, I think as long as you're honest with the community when you run for election uh, about your approach, um, then, then I think uh, I think you can pursue it however you would like. Um, for me, I I do use the platform. I think that's how I can best be effective. Uh, you know, you mentioned I was the first Green elected to Monash. You know, there are there are two of us now on a council of eleven, and sometimes I'll agree with all my colleagues, and we'll, we'll be working on the same things, and that's fine. And other times I won't. One of the ways that I can be uh, effective is is by talking about you know my my position and why I have that position, and trying to explain that to the community and to others. Um, I also think occasionally I can be useful to council as a whole, uh, as as a as someone you know who's prepared to go out to bat on these these different issues. I think um, sometimes it's easier as a councillor compared to as an, as a mayor or an official spokesperson for a council to to have a, to have a more uh, you know free ranging conversation um, where you can connect with people person to person. And, and I'm, I'm very happy to do that as long as I think it's productive. Um, just take a side trip there based on something you just said. Um, so one of two Greens councillors now, um, I forget the numbers, but there are a lot more Greens endorsed councillors at councils, particularly around metropolitan Melbourne now. Is that important from your point of view? And how do you respond to people who say that is an unnecessary or perhaps uh, an unwelcome politicisation of the role of a councillor? Yeah, look, I... I think it's interesting when people say, oh, you know, um, politics and political parties play no role in, in local councils. I think that uh, really ignores the fact that that most councils, a lot of councils, are already heavily politicised. You know, we've got a majority of councillors at Monash um, are members of the Labor Party. Now, they don't run as Labor councillors, yeah. but they, they work together, uh, they, they fundraise together, they caucus, they vote together, they support each other for leadership positions. And that's fine. They're totally entitled to do that. Uh, but I think that this perception that everyone out there who isn't a green is an independent is is not correct. And uh, in my view, I, I like the Greens approach better because the Greens endorse candidates everywhere. We say that we're Greens. People know what they're getting when they vote for us. Um, and so for me, that personally, I find that that's you know an honest approach with the community. There's no surprises. I'm very clear about what I intend to do and achieve. Um, I'm very clear about my affiliations and, um, you know, I try and be really accessible and talk to Mm. people about why I think what I think and why I'm going to do what I'm going to do. Yeah. So one of the issues you uh, did make a bit of a stand on a few months ago was the um, the drag time uh, story time events that a number of councils were challenged by with this rise of... um, uh, unacceptable, most would say, behaviour and threats against people. Um, have we come anywhere down the path of resolving that issue since that time? It was probably about May, wasn't it? Yeah, look, it's, unfortunately, I, I don't think we have. Um, 
it's an extremely, extremely fraught uh, issue. I think, you know, LGBT events um, and and community contributions are, are really being um, held under siege, I think, by other parts of our community, which is which is very sad. Um, I think they are being uh, bundled up with a whole range of other issues that people are quite angry about and mm. and, um, and a whole lot of mistrust in local government from certain pockets of the community who are, who are organising and, um, and, and creating narratives and, and talking to themselves uh, and, and each other about, about these narratives that, you know, councils out to get them for, for A, B or C. Um, the... the the incidents at, at Monash, I think, was really a bit of a flashpoint for whatever reason. Um, there have been, you know, a number of councils who who had similar things happen, but Monash became a bit of, you know, a lightning rod for, for that at the time. Uh, and, and and it was really difficult. I think for members of the community, for, for council staff, for um, for, for council wars, for, for the performer who was going to perform, it wasn't something that as councils we've been involved in. We didn't even know the event was happening until it started to become controversial. And so uh, really um, everyone had to assess uh, how, how best they could be involved. My view was um, I wanted to try and, and be a voice uh, that could be heard by the LGBT community as you know someone from, from council clearly saying, we're here, we understand the issues, we support you, um, we're going to do the best we can. Um, but unfortunately, you know, the the situation we have is that councils aren't set up to to uh, face the, this sort of uh, aggression and threats of violence. We really needed the support of Victoria Police and, and they provided the support that they could. But um, in the end, we were unable to continue. Yeah. And I think at the time you said you felt the state government hadn't done enough or wasn't doing enough to help? Have you seen any signs that that might be changing? No, look, there, there were some uh, initial conversations. You know, I, I wasn't involved, but I understand there's some initial conversations with some mayors and CEOs about security and these sort of magic matters. Um, I certainly haven't seen any improvements at Monash in that respect. Uh, we still regularly have people heckling and interrupting our meetings and so on, but nowhere near the level that we saw then, you know, with hundreds and hundreds of people and, um, you know, threats of threats of violence and so on. But um, there will continue to be those flashpoints, I think, and and really it's an issue for, for councils right across the state. I, I can't imagine, you know, I'm in a big metropolitan council, I can't imagine uh, what it would be like on a small and rural council having to deal with these matters. There, there's simply mm. no way that mm. you'd be able to navigate it without significant support. Yeah. As you say, it's across the states, across the country, and it's internationally. We see stories about this type of extremist behaviour virtually every week. Um, and one wonders what can be done, what what needs to happen to change this whole narrative, or where does it end? Yeah, it's, it's difficult. I mean, personally, this is one of the reasons why I think it's it's really important to try and be uh, open and sincere and to engage as a political representative. I think uh, the more that uh, politicians at all levels of government can do that and can demonstrate to people that they are real people and that they can have, you know, you know have genuine conversations with people, can listen to people, can um, uh, disagree respectfully, uh, I think that's modelling the sort of behaviour that we want to see from, from citizens participating mm. in democracy. Um, I know that anything I do or don't do is not going to change that um, in and of itself, but it's a contribution that I can make as an individual. Uh, so many things I wanted to ask you, Josh, and I am mindful of time, but I notice you've you've lived and worked in, in London and Nepal, of, of all places. I'm not sure if there's others on the list. How did those particular experiences come about? Yeah, I, I, I was lucky enough to, um, to to live in London for a couple of years. I, I worked... Um, I worked within the, the National Health Service, um, organising community sector organisations, uh, trying to keep people out of out of hospital um, and reduce their, their hospital stays by increasing community supports. And, and that was a fascinating experience for me and, and sort of instructive for my local government um, career, actually, seeing, you know, how placemaking worked and how different ways of operating communities um, uh, could, could be could be great or could be undermined through various factors. Um, 
and that was really uh, taking advantage of, of the uh, the visa situation towards the end of my twenties before my opportunity ran right. out. <laughs> um, yeah. uh, and and I, I was I was in Nepal for for some time. I was um, doing some pro bono consultancy uh, with with a couple of charities there, trying to assist them in uh, establishing a structure which would. Uh, better endear them to to donors and, and partners in Australia. Um, they were working with children who had um, who had lost one or both parents, uh, and then uh, also with rural women in uh, in the south of Nepal mm. who were essentially living in huge amounts of poverty, um, who had lost their uh, partners for whatever reason. Um, and again. You know that was some really wonderful community development work. You know, very very grassroots um, working with people who wanted to support each other and try to enable and, and facilitate that to work as, as best as good. Um, but I, I certainly learned a lot in in that time, uh, and it, it gives you a lot of perspective. You know, at the time it was pre earthquake uh, when I was in Nepal, um, and the at the time at the time the poorest country in, in Asia, and it, it may still be um, so. You know the the needs are, are totally different to what we see in our nice um, nice leafy safe suburbs. Yeah, a perspective sounds like a good word for it. And I was thinking it, it must have been a, a one of those life changing experiences that perhaps people don't get to do that that often. Yeah, I, I've I've been very lucky to have those opportunities. I think, uh, and and certainly recognise that they're they're not opportunities which come to everyone. So. Um, I, I try not to take anything anything yeah. for, for granted. Uh, I, when I was growing up, certainly seeing all, all the the, uh, the the various situations you know that people could be growing up in, and and seeing how how little opportunity people had, uh, I've I've really tried to make the most of every opportunity I've been given. So, what does life away from work, away from council, and your other responsibilities look like? And I like to ask everyone on this program this question: How do you keep balance in your life? Yeah, I, I'm very bad at that, Chris. <laughs> I probably don't have too many pearls, <laughs> pearls of wisdom. Um, I, I find it I find it hard to to um, sit still and not start a new project for for very long. But look, I, I think for me, being in nature is really important. Making sure you you get out in nature. That's one of the things I love about working at KHG. You know, we work in beautiful gardens. It's very easy to to have meetings, to take phone calls or whatever while, while you're in that beautiful garden environment. So. Uh, making the most of those opportunities is really critical. Um, I, I have a, a, a very young uh, daughter who's a, who's a delight. She's running around and, and walking and talking now, and it's it's great fun to to join her on her adventures. Um, so certainly uh, love to do that. But I think you know just just remembering that you know you're one person and you're only human. You can't fix the problems of the world. You know, being able to switch your brain off sometimes is 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 extremely important. So. Uh, I try and stay in the moment with her and I try and stay in the moment in the natural world around me and, and those moments really help. Do you have a long-term plan, aspirations uh, perhaps beyond local government? Look, I, I have from, from time to time. I think the, the political environment has changed uh, a lot um, over, over the past decade and uh, it, it can be a really unpleasant place to be. So. I suppose I'm at a point in my life where I'm trying to assess, you know, what what does what does come next. I, I don't know what the answer is uh, yet, but uh, a, 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 as as much as I have any idea, I think it will be broadly um, trying to uh, assist to make people's lives better, um, however I can, how I can contribute that, whether that's at a structural level, whether that's an individual level. Um, that's what I'll be doing for a long time, I think. And not to put words in your mouth, but it sounds like you may or may not be putting your hand up for another term next year when elections roll around. Yeah, look, I've I've got to make that decision. Um, I think uh, I think there are a few factors in in play there, and I think one of those factors is, uh, you know, uh, what I referred to earlier of still having things you want to do. I think if you're not passionate about it, and and you know you, you're not really fully invested then you you owe it to the community i think not to be there so i'm assessing whether there's enough in the tank for another term or not um i think there probably will be but uh it may well be my last if i do go again okay you heard it here first regardless of what the outcome of that thought process is uh thank you josh it's been great to speak with you we've covered a lot of ground and i really do appreciate you being so generous with your your time and your thoughts no worries chris thanks for having me
Dr. Josh Fergus, a councillor at the uh, City of Monash and Vice President of the Victorian Local Governance Association, our guest today on Local Leaders from VLGA Connect. Mm-hmm.